Hi, everyone. So today, it's really my pleasure uh, to have this uh, conversation with uh, Guido. Uh, Guido Van Rossum uh, is the creator of the Python programming language, and he grew up in the Netherlands and studied at the University of Amsterdam, where he graduated with a master's degree in mathematics and computer science. And then after college, he created Python, and today we're going to talk a lot about it. He then moved to the United States. I know that in 2005, he joined Google. In 2013, he joined Dropbox. And finally, now he's a, a, a distinguished engineer at Microsoft. So welcome, Guido, and thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Nice to meet you, Francesca. So let's start with the first question. Um, this is more like a, a general question. So um, can you share a little bit more uh, about the story behind the Python's start? So why and how did you decide to develop it as a side project? Well, how much time have you got? That's that. <coughs> I, I have a long only version of that story. I'll, I'll, I'll try to cut it down a bit. Yeah. Uh, so after college, I uh, joined a research lab in the Netherlands called CWI. Uh, and my first project there that I worked on for three and a half years uh, was the implementation of a programming language. Uh, the pr language was named ABC. Uh, it was a beautiful design. Uh, I really enjoyed working with that team. I learned a lot. Uh, and the language totally flopped. There was like, it was impossible to find users. Uh, we didn't have any distribution channels. We didn't have any obvious ways to promote our language. Uh, and so the project was canceled. I worked on other things, including a distributed operating system named Amoeba. Uh, but at some point, I think during the development of Amoeba, I was writing a lot of application code because Amoeba was sort of this super researchy thing. There was a microkernel written by a couple of PhD students. Uh, and I was actually uh, hired as a programmer and our task was to sort of fill out the operating system with useful applications. Like there was a shell, there was a compiler, but there were now like backup tools or mail readers or any of those handy things. Mm -hmm. So I was writing utilities and the only, since the only compiler we had was a C compiler, uh, my choice for every utility was write it from scratch in C uh, or cobble it together as a shell script. And uh, often the, the sort of the, purpose of the tool was such that it wasn't so easy to write it as a shell script. So I would was writing stuff in C, but of course, productivity in C is very slow. And I sort of, at the same time, I had in the back of my mind, this ABC language was such a wonderful thing. Uh, it's a shame that I couldn't write my utilities for Amoeba in ABC. And <laughs> I thought, well, okay, and now, now, now we get to the point where it was good that uh, the project leader was on a sabbatical in Silicon Valley and uh, left the, the team of programmers more or less to themselves. Uh, and I had no social life. Uh, <coughs> so I, I decided over the, the Christmas holidays, actually, uh, that it would probably take me about three months to uh, imp design and implement a new programming language based on many of the ideas from ABC, but also ideas I had myself and I had sort of some criticism on parts of ABC. <clears throat> and then after those three months, I would be much more productive and everyone else on the team would also be much more productive in our creation of utilities for Amoeba. And then within half a year or so, we'd, we would be even. And after that, it was, was pure sort of an increase in, in total output of the team. I did actually, after three months, have a sort of a demoable version of Python. Wow. Okay. Uh, 
but basically Python continued to consume my life for much longer than I had anticipated. I mean, if this, I think the story about productivity was more or less an excuse to, to do something I thought was more fun than writing utilities and crank, cranking out uh, backup tools and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I think in the, in the end for the, for the Amoeba project project, we probably sort of was maybe a break even, uh, but for myself, it was obviously, uh, a big success after a little more than a year, uh, several people who also really enjoyed using Python because we were using it. We even had like the first summer we had, we had an intern using Python for some crazy stuff. Uh, so it, it, it was a useful tool. Uh, we decided to open source it, which at the time was a very different process. Uh, but this time uh, I hooked into something called Usenet, which was an online community, mostly focused on the US, but sort of with branches in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, and sort of, we promoted Python there <laughs> and it was an instant success. My inbox started filling up with sort of fan mail and uh, bug reports and unsolicited sort of uh, feature requests and patches and all sorts of all, all the good stuff that that you sort of you want that strokes your ego and that helps mm -hmm. sort of that make the, the thing a better thing. Well, that is a fantastic uh, story, and uh, I think that we are all very glad to hear that you know you, you decided to develop uh, this uh, um, programming language. And uh, uh, something that I'm curious uh, um, to hear more about, and uh, we received this question also um, on Twitter. Uh, I work in uh, the machine learning and the AI space right now. So, uh, did you predict Python being used so much in the machine learning and AI community when you started the language? Oh my gosh, no, 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 not at all. I had no idea. I mean, this that this was like 1990. I think yeah. it was still the the sort of the the deep AI winter. AI was a very sort of disrespected field because in the 60s and 70s it had made so many promises and none of those had really come true. And so everybody thought that that was a dead field, that, that we, wouldn't, we wouldn't get to any of that science fiction for another century or so. Well, I'm sure, clearly there were people who, who had other ideas, but that was sort of the general feeling. And sort of the goal of Python really was to be another tool in the toolbox of professional programmers, soft, mm -hmm. serious software developers who would otherwise be writing code in C or C++ maybe, uh, or uh, as shell scripts. <laughs> Yes, and you know, I'm, right now there are so many different uh, frameworks uh, that are used for deep learning and machine learning. So it's uh, very interesting to see how you know the evolution of uh, of Python has actually impacted the uh, the machine learning and AI uh, field uh, so much. So I, I got a, 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 another question uh, from one of the guests uh, that says, uh, um, "So I read your blog post about the origins of the functional features of Python. What can you say?" as an update now in 2021. Uh, yeah, so I shouldn't repeat what I wrote in that blog post. Actually, it's a pretty old blog post. I don't even mm -hmm. remember exactly what I wrote at the time, but I imagine that it described how uh, a, a sort of fully featured implementation of Lambda, Map, Filter, and Reduce appeared in my inbox in, I think in the, the, the early 90s, actually. It might, it might have been the mid 90s. And I didn't know much about functional programming. I, I had heard some talks from some academics about uh, certain functional programming languages, and I thought it was marvelous, uh, but I didn't really understand it. And I had never tried to use a functional language myself. Uh, but at that time, I was basically taking every 
every new feature that that sort of that felt okay to me, I would just sort of scratch my head for a few seconds and say, sure, let's put that, let's put that in the language and and re release a new version. And now we have these things. Uh, I think. Uh, Lambdas have been very successful despite uh, them being intentionally sort of simplified. Uh, they've also been widely misunderstood. People have often, I, I remember almost getting into a shouting match uh, with someone who thought that only Lambdas had the semantics of uh, closures and nested functions did not. Mm -hmm. It was like a huge misunderstanding uh, based on that. I think we both had a little too much beer, so it was fine in the end. Uh, so filter and map uh, are pretty useful things, uh, but I've never been able to, to sort of follow code that was using reduce, <laughs> whether in Python or in other languages. So eventually I decided to sort of cut it out of the built-ins. And there's there there are still people on Hacker News uh, who are mad at me for that, but eh, it's my language, not theirs. You can design your own language, and 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 they've done. Okay. For sure. uh, so, but what what happened instead was that uh, a guy named Tim Peters, I think, whispered in my ears something about comprehensions. Now that was something that I was familiar with because, like. In college, in your first math class, they they show, or maybe even in 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 high school, they show you this set notation where you say all the x vertical bar, where x is greater than five or something, and that that sort of that made total sense to me. And so that the specific notation of comprehensions, which started out with list comprehensions and uh, generator expressions and eventually was expanded with set comprehensions and dictionary comprehensions. Uh, thanks, Barry, for those. Uh, that's That's been like a real uh, game changer for the language, I would say. Very, very interesting. And uh, here, uh, I uh, I got a different question, but still uh, very uh, interesting. That is a more uh, general question about the scope of Python in web development and mobile app development. What's what's your take on this? Oh, those are those are two very different questions. And yeah. Take take web development. Of course, web development neatly separates in a front end and a back end, except then that the people who write back end code have a whole stack of layers where there's still a front and a back. Uh, but if you have sort of the stuff that runs on the browser versus the stuff that runs on the server, all mm -hmm. the stuff that runs on the server, uh, Python is a pretty popular language there. Uh, at Google, I worked on projects that uh, were, were sort of built on Python, although most Google stuff wasn't. Uh, at Dropbox, uh, the whole Dropbox server is built in Python. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at what runs in the browser, that's the world of JavaScript. And uh, unless it translates to JavaScript, uh, you can't run it. And there have been various experiments. I mean, I remember there was a time that people wrote applets uh, and there was actually even in 95 or 96, I believe, there was a, there was some crazy hack uh, where web browsers, I mean, there, I think there was only one web browser and it could dynamically load an extension and then you could use an arbitrary language. But it was very limited. I think the other language then would have like a square box on the screen of fixed size where it could draw what it wanted and that was about it. Uh, but we got that working for Python at some point, but it wasn't successful huh. because users would have to download that extension and install it in their browser. And there were a thousand things that could go wrong. Plus most users weren't so keen on downloading 
and installing stuff before they could sort of run a website that they were planning to visit for about five seconds. Uh, <laughs> Java actually tried to do the same thing and similarly failed. Mm. Uh, so I'm I'm not particularly uh, worried that, that that didn't work. Now, of course, there are various people who have different strategies for running Python in the browser. Uh, there are a few projects. The only name that I can remember is Brython, but I think there are a few others that mm. somehow translate Python to JavaScript or have a Python interpreter written in JavaScript. Uh, in theory, you can you put that on your website and your users will never have to know. And some people do that, especially the translation approach works can be pretty effective, but it's like you have no support from the browser vendors. Uh, nobody in the Python community knows what you're doing. It's very limited because the environment in the browser has sort of very different IO primitives. Uh, you, you can't block for IO, for example. You can't open a file and read a bunch of stuff from it, really. Uh, so that is still not very popular. There is also WebAssembly. Uh, people have done sort of hero projects where they translate all of C Python into WebAssembly because there are apparently there are experimental GCC backends that just produce WebAssembly code instead of uh, machine language. And then sort of to make it useful, they compile all of, of uh, the scientific data stack and you can sort of do numeric data processing and it it, it, it all works and WebAssembly is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, it sort of, it's a big download and uh, you have something that comes short of the performance and the functionality of when you just ran the whole thing in a notebook on your own computer or ran the whole thing on a server mm -hmm. uh, with with a proper ui so i don't know if there's a future for that uh i don't mind so much uh different languages have have different goals i mean nobody's asking rust when uh, you can write rust in the browser at least that wouldn't wouldn't seem seem a useful sort of target for Rust either. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Java failed in that respect and that they don't have any uh, problem. I mean, Python should should focus on on the the targets, the, the sort of the application areas where it's good. And for the web, that's the back end. And for scientific data processing, that's pretty much everything. As long as you can wrap something like TensorFlow or PyTorch or uh, NumPy and based things in general. So coming back to mobile app development, uh, that is a little bit of a sore point. It would be nice if uh, mobile apps could be written in Python. Uh, there are actually a few people working on that, uh, but C Python is sort of has. 30 years of history where it's been built for for an environment that is a workstation, a desktop, or uh, a server. And sort of, it, it, it expects that kind of environment and the users also expect that kind of environment. So if you, the people who, who sort of have managed to cross compile C Python to run on, uh, say, on an Android tablet or even on iOS. Uh, they find that it sort of it eats up a lot of resources. Now, if you're sort of if you're in a classroom situation and you plug in your tablet and you connect a keyboard to it and you want to learn to code. Well, maybe you have a slightly cheaper setup than if you use the Chromebook or something like that. Uh, so especially in third world countries, uh, tablets or even phones are often 
the only thing that people have. Uh, but running running C Python in that environment is uh, sort of it's not a great fit because it sort of it's it's still rel it compared to what the mobile operating systems expect python is is big and slow mm -hmm. uh yeah. and 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 sort of it it basically uses a lot of battery charge so you can you can sort of if you're coding in python you you probably very quickly run down your battery you also probably quickly run out of memory uh and it, sort of like Android is that pretends to be a Linux system, but you can't actually fork a process. So that's a problem because now Python code that sort of Python important Python libraries like multiprocessing detect that they're on Linux and they know they create to create a new process you fork. Well, that doesn't work. So now does multiprocessing have to figure out how to create another process on an Android? Uh, yeah. device so it's it's like it would be nice if if there was more but it's it's not an easy thing thing to introduce and i i wonder if for mobile development it would wouldn't be better to start with something like MicroPython, or okay. maybe a sort of a, a medium medium python which assumes there is an operating system and a fair amount of memory, but doesn't assume it's running in an environment like CPython. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, um, some of the newer uh, programming languages, uh, such as uh, Rust, and uh, uh, that, of course, is, uh, aim at, uh, is aiming at uh, different audiences and not solving different uh, uh, type of uh, uh, problems. Um, there is also another um, language like TypeScript. What do you think uh, of, of those languages? Oh, I, I, I love languages, in, at least in theory. I mean, I always read language tutorials. I'm very bad <laughs> at actually sort of downloading a language implementation and uh, and trying to code something because it's it's almost always easier to oh I, I, I already know how to do that in Python and uh, or I just want to contribute to Python so I haven't actually learned Rust I've spoken to many people who have and who have written serious applications in it or are writing serious applications in it and it sounds like it's a great language for sort of for certain things i mean rust yeah. really sort of improves on c plus plus in one particular area it sort of it makes it much harder to bypass the checks in the compiler and it's of course it's so it solves the memory allocation uh problem in in a near perfect way I'm, I'm sure that if you're developing a really large serious application every once in a while you end up having to cheat and then you're still on your own but it's much harder to to sort of be sure that uh so if if you wrote the same thing in c plus plus you could not be as sure that as uh, compared to rust that like you've gotten all your memory uh allocation and the memory management stuff right so rust is is an interesting language i still think that go is a very interesting language too okay of, of all the new languages go is probably the most pythonic or at least the sort of the general purpose new languages uh there's also julia which is sort of an an interesting sort of take on something Python like uh, it it has enough details that look very similar to Python that then when you realize oh but all the indexing is one based and ranges are inclusive instead of exclusive you think ah I, I <laughs> nobody should ever try to code in Julia and in Python on the same day. Uh, my understanding is that Julia is is sort of much more of a niche language, and if you're in that niche, 
it is superior because the compiler sort of optimizes your code for you in a way that that Python probably never will. Uh, on the other hand, it is much more limited in, in other areas. And I wouldn't expect that anybody ever is going to write a, a web server in Julia and uh, get a lot of mileage out of it. And I'm sure in five minutes that will be on Hacker News with a counter uh, example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, you mentioned TypeScript, also TypeScript. a great language. Uh, yeah. You might have noticed that in the past six or seven years, we've been adding uh, optional static typing, as we call it, to Python, yep. also known as gradual typing. Uh, I wasn't actually aware of TypeScript when we started that project. So I, I can't say that we were sort of inspired by TypeScript initially. Uh, TypeScript, because it sort of jumped on the JavaScript bandwagon, uh, I think did a few things, and, and because Anders is, is a really smart guy, uh, TypeScript did a few things that, that Python is still sort of waiting to figure out. <laughs> so nowadays, we definitely look look at TypeScript for examples and, and sort of, we, we have a typing sig where we discuss extensions of the typing syntax and semantic and the type system in general for, for Python. And we definitely sometimes sort of propose new features because we know that, that certain features were also sort of originally, originally <coughs> excuse me, initially lacking in TypeScript and then added to TypeScript based on user demand and very successful in TypeScript. And so now we sort of, we can see we have that, we are in that same situation because JavaScript and Python are relatively simple. So TypeScript and Python type system are also relatively si similar, uh, much more so than Python uh, and say C++ or Rust or Java. So, we we are learning from from TypeScript, and okay. occasionally uh, uh, from my conversations with Anders, it sounds like TypeScript is also learning from uh, Python, just like Java JavaScript has learned from Python in a few areas. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, C++, and we do have a question uh, from a professor who is asking if you think that universities should teach uh, Python before teaching other programming languages such as uh, C++, for example. I also know oh, that... absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that there there's are no some... doubt about that. that there, there, a few years ago, there was an interesting article published in the yeah. communications of the ACM about sort of surveys of uh, major universities that had all switched to uh, Python as their sort of intro to coding uh, classes. Even MIT's famous uh, struck, st uh, whatever. Well, MIT had a scheme-based class for decades uh, and uh, they're still teaching that, but the the vast majority of students uh, first learn Python with a robotics class. Yeah. And uh, so going back to uh, Python, um, like a, a, like more like the evolution of uh, uh, Python, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is like, if you had to uh, share with us uh, one uh, biggest learning, uh, you know, from the transition from Python 2 to Python 3, what is that? Ah, the biggest learning. So I, I normally talk about that as sort of a mistake because Python was more successful than the core developers realized. Mm. Uh, and so what we, we, we should have been much more aware of and, and much more sort of supportive of of transitioning from Python 2 to Python 3. And in our own experience, we, we thought that that transition would be relatively simple because we were all like 
the Einsteins of Python programming, of course. And we could translate uh, code from Python 2 to Python 3 in our sleep. And probably our Python 2 code already was written in a style that didn't need much translation anyway. Uh, what we found was that Python actually is also very successful with people who uh, aren't great programmers. Uh, and there are whole sort of groups of businesses that write Python code that solves some, some problem for another business uh, and is delivered as an application that then sort of runs without supervision. And, and these are custom, pro custom projects. And so all these things are left running on servers. It's like old Excel spreadsheets almost that, that sort of survive any reorg in the organization that, that software is still running. Uh, but it doesn't up survive an upgrade from the default Python binary to something newer. Uh, and we weren't, we, we sort of, we totally neglected that that was happening to Python. We basically thought, oh, there, there are a few other smart people like us who are loving Python. And they would all agree that uh, Python 3 is better than Python 2. And it turned out that the, the situation was much more nuanced. So certainly if there ever is going to be a Python 4, uh, well, if you've, if you've seen my Twitter stream, if you look me up on Twitter, I pin a tweet that is like a two line FAQ about Python 4, which is basically the transition to Python 4 will not be anything like the transition to Python 3 was because okay. we've learned our lesson. Interesting. And how about, uh, you know, um, uh, dependency uh, resolutions? Like I know that uh, PIP now is PIP21, right? Um, has a very good uh, um, mm -hmm. support, uh, a very good uh, offer in terms of uh, um, uh, dependencies uh, resolution. So uh, is there going to be something new there on, on that aspect uh, in the next version of Python? Uh, I I still think of that as as something that really is outside the language proper. Uh, pip is not the only package manager. Mm -hmm. uh, even pip twenty one is not perfect in its sort of dependency resolution. Uh, it's always better to use virtual environments and sort of have a separate virtual environment for each application, because that makes it much easier to avoid uh, what used to be called DLL hell, because that's that, or, or version hell. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it, you, you can't avoid versioning hell in all cases, unfortunately. And uh, that that's, that's unfortunately a fact of life when you're developing software that is, built on top of layers and layers and layers of other software as especially the people in uh, in machine learning and uh, data science world of course are doing all the time there's yeah. so many useful packages but different communities developing developing different sort of packages don't always have the same policies about sort of which versions of lower level packages they they support and then when someone in an application tries to sort of combine pandas and pytorch and tensorflow you probably uh, get into terrible trouble i see so we we will see uh, uh, in terms of you know the next uh, the next version of Python. There is a, a someone here that is a, a new to Python. Uh, is a guest and he's asking uh, curious uh, is uh, is curious why uh, it is called actually Python. Ah yeah, I, I I forget to mention that detail in the the origin story. So uh, one, I'm a big fan of Monty Python's Flying Circus always have been uh, that that show sort of made a few appearances on Dutch TV in the I think in the early 70s and I just was floored I thought it was so funny 
I learned English from that in part. Uh, so anyway, it's named after Monty Python's Flying Circus. And uh, for the longest time, I resisted any sort of use of snakes for Python logos. I remember designing a logo for Python for a very early Mac version. This was like Mac OS 8 or so. Uh, <clears throat> very, very cute hardware. Uh, and the logo I designed was a 16 ton weight. Because that was a sort of the only, that, that was the simplest thing that I could draw with, with sort of <laughs> my limited drawing skills and it had to fit in 16 by 16 pixels. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I was a two part question and I, I, I blanked out on the second part. Uh, this person was uh, no, there was just uh, saying that he's uh, new to Python, and so we wanted just to know a little bit more about uh, the story of the name Python, and I think that you you answer uh, that. Um, okay, yeah. The, well, the other part of the story was that in Amoeba we had sort of a local tra tradition, which was just sort of a joke among the three or four programmers working on it, that we we named various parts of the the system after uh, popular TV shows. And the third part was that I recognized that there was a trend in naming languages after sort of important historical figures from the world of science and math and engineering like Pascal or Ada or Eiffel. And I sort of, I was in a rebellious mood and I thought, I don't want it to sort of be named after a Greek god or uh, an important figure from the Renaissance. And I didn't know those names that well either, although I had learned a few of them in school. And so uh, sort of choosing references to pop culture was, was my way of sort of going against that. That's a nice, a nice story. Um, uh, there is another, another guest that is also asking a very interesting question uh, about uh, Python for quantum computing. Computing. So uh, he's asking you: There will be Python for quantum computing, or do you think that is too soon to know it? Uh, I think even MicroPython requires more memory than a quantum computer has. So. Sorry. I, <laughs> I don't know what to do with Python in, in quantum computing. I know that there is a, a Microsoft package that I think claims to emulate a quantum computer and it's all written in Python. Uh, but that that's not really, to me, to me, that's not really an application of, quant of, of Python in quantum computing. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of Microsoft, so right now you are a, a distinguished engineer at the Microsoft. I know that you work in the developer division. Um, so that division is also uh, well known for tools such as uh, uh, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code uh, that is uh, supported by uh, the open source also um, community. And uh, so what's the, your role there? And do you have a specific plan? Uh, I'm so I came out of retirement mostly out of boredom. I sort of a year and a half ago I left Dropbox and I was really done there after seven years. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I'll go, I'll I'll go travel with my wife and we'll go uh, on lots of bike trips and we'll get together with friends. And then the pandemic ha happened, and uh, life was pretty limited. And I realized I needed a project and I started going back to coding and sort of specific Python improvements. And I sort of, I have to admit, I got frustrated with a certain thing I wanted to add to Python where uh, there was just endless discussion that kept going around in circles. And I thought, maybe I should just get a job again. And I asked around and I found that uh, I could actually work at Microsoft part-time. And uh, I don't know, I still think that, that so a mistake was made somewhere and they accidentally set me up with interviews with people at the, the sort of VP level. I remember being interviewed by Kevin Scott, who of course is the CTO, but at the time that I had blanked out on that. 
<laughs> so in the middle of the interview, we were like, we were getting along great, and we were just chatting about random stuff. And I asked, "Yeah, so what exactly is 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 your role in this company?" <laughs> So I'm I'm actually very surprised that they still decided to uh, hire me. And uh, I'm an individual contributor. Uh, I I'm I'm not a director. Uh, and I sort of for for three or four months I actually just oriented myself in the company, uh, taking meetings with random people. Uh, almost in the meeting who are doing interesting stuff with Python in the context of machine learning, of course, Azure, notebooks, Excel, you name it. Uh, <laughs> and at sort of, nobody told me, well, shouldn't you be sort of getting your hands dirty with coding? But I felt that I, I, I went back to the workforce so that I could do more coding on a focused project and not so that I could take uh, meetings all day long, three days a week. <laughs> and so I, I sort of started started a systematic search for, well, what, what kind of project shall I take? Because I was pretty much given complete freedom in what I would wanted to work on. Mm -hmm. And so I... I looked into machine learning and notebooks and I realized that machine learning uh, is a very big field, uh, which I have, despite Python's su big success in that field, uh, and I would say that, that the field has become more successful because of Python and Python has become more popular because that field has taken off. That's very nice symbiosis, but I've always sort of ignored that field. I know exactly how to build a web server in Python or a web client or something doing something with databases or user interfaces. I have no idea how to begin writing a framework for machine learning or even how to do a simple machine learning application. I've, I've sort of, I've tried to follow tutorials in that area and i've talked to various people uh and of course i i had like super good access to all sorts of smart people in in the machine learning field at microsoft as well and i realized it would be a mistake to try and sort of contribute to that field because it takes like you got to spend three or four years on a PhD in the field, and then maybe you can contribute something useful. I don't know if that's your experience, but that's sort of what it felt like to me. And so I, I in the end, I decided I would go back to my roots uh, and uh, sort of collect a team of people and start working on making Python faster. And at the Python Language Summit earlier this week, I actually announced this sort of publicly uh, that uh, now together with two other core developers, Eric Snow and Mark Shannon, and mm -hmm. Mark especially is a longtime expert on uh, faster Python virtual machines. Uh, so I'm very excited that uh, we're going to uh, contribute as core developers and as Microsoft employees or contractors uh, directly to CPython. Uh, we've contributed a few small things to Python 3.10, but 3.10 just went into beta a few weeks before we sort of launched our initiative officially. Uh, so now we feel we have about a year to prove that we can actually uh, move the needle on Python performance uh, and 3.11 will be much faster than uh, 3.10. And it's interesting, this the sort of making Python faster has also uh, attracted the attention of groups elsewhere. There is a team at Facebook who just open sourced their efforts, mostly focused on Python 3.8. Okay. Uh, there are a few ex Dropbox people uh, who work on a thing called Piston, they had Piston version one was a Dropbox product that was open sourced. Piston version version two was just open sourced. 
is based on Python 3.8 again. Uh, I know there are a few people in other places that haven't uh, come out and said so publicly. Oh yeah, there's also uh, uh, Anthony Shaw, uh, who is a developer advocate at Microsoft, uh, who in his spare time, I think, after after completing a book on uh, Python in, C Python internals, which I can recommend to anyone who wants to get going with hacking on C Python, uh, he decided to teach himself more about virtual machines and uh, just-in-time compilers, and he picked up a project named Pigeon. Mm -hmm. I think it's spelled P-Y-J-I-O-N, uh, <coughs> which is a, a JIT compiler for Python based on uh, the .NET framework. So making C Python faster or making Python faster is sort of suddenly back back on the front page of the news i would say and i hope that uh, with my team i'll be able to uh, uh contribute some to that field which yes. feels like i do know something about that area <laughs> yes and we are so glad to to hear that this sounds very very exciting as a, as a plan to have at microsoft and also i really like you know the fact that uh, there is interest from other teams at other companies in the community so that's 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 great to to hear mm -hmm. so there are a lot of people that are actually asking uh, the same question that uh, is there going to be a python 4 uh, i think that probably the most interesting question is about the, uh, there's going to be like the next version of python i'm not sure if it's going to be python 4 uh, and if you want just to to share a little bit more about what are going to be like the the most uh, important changes if there are going to be any any important changes okay well so python 4 at this point whenever python 4 is mentioned in the core development team it is very much as a joke uh we've learned our lesson uh from python 3 versus 2 and so it's it's almost taboo to talk about a Python 4 in a serious sense. And most of the time uh, when people say, oh, we'll do that in Python 4, everyone is in on the joke. And uh, it's just a funny way of saying that will never happen. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, so Python has, has point releases and so we have, we've, Currently, the most re the, the most current version is Python 3.9. The version that just went into beta, we've had like alpha since the beginning of the year, and the uh, sort of final release date is going to be October. Will be 3.10, <laughs> uh, and we now have a strict annual release schedule. So a year after that will be 3.11, and after that will be 3.12, and so on and so forth. And we can go up to 3.99 before we have to uh, add another digit. Yeah. But going from one digit to two digits was definitely uh, not completely trivial, but still much better than going from three to four. So will there ever be a Python 4? Uh, and, and how will it be different? I don't know. The, the sort of the, the speeding up for Python is just going to be incremental and it will not be i mean it will just like some speed new speed will be coming in 3.11 and then we'll speed it up more in 3.12 and then we'll speed it up more in 3.13 and so on uh i could imagine that at some point uh we are forced to to abandon uh, certain binary or API compatibility uh, for C extensions. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. We might want to uh, change the way garbage collection is handled. Currently, it's done through reference counting. Uh, the reference counting machinery is pretty, pretty sort of public and directly accessible by uh, third-party extensions. Uh, which makes it very hard to change the any any aspect almost of the memory management. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the global interpreter lock is also something that people have been hoping to get rid of for a very long time. Uh, the last attempt uh, was by Larry Hastings, the galactomy. I think he's he's given up on that. I haven't heard a status update in a long time, and Larry seems to have moved on to other hobbies. In still in the Python world, of course. <laughs> uh, so, but if there was a significant incompatibility for C extensions without changing the language itself, uh, and and if we were to be able to get rid of the gill if one or both of those events were to happen we probably would be forced to call it 4.0 because of the compatibility issues at the the sort of the c extension level i see yeah uh the the i think the current plan for getting rid of the gill is actually very different uh, we're also, and my colleague Eric Snow is also working on that. Uh, there is a project called Multiple Subinterpreters, uh, which is a feature that we've sort of had for a long time, but uh, it had various issues. And slowly we seem to be migrating to a version of multiple subinterpreters where there's no shared data between the subinterpreters at all, except that they all live in the same process. And uh, you can switch between them very efficiently. And at that point, when, once each subinterpreter has its own global interpreter lock, uh, we will have a different approach to, to sort of using all the cores that you need because you can just spin off worker threads in a sense, except worker subinterpreters. I see. Uh, and that's, that's probably a more effective model than sort of. Uh, multiple threads with shared everything uh, like we have in Java or uh, C++. Mm -hmm. So that in it, that approach to getting rid of the gill would not require uh, renumbering the version of the language. So then the only thing that really would require us to sort of declare an, a, a sort of major incompatibility event would be other changes in the C API. And I, I personally think that we can actually just gradually make those changes over time, deprecate things slowly, uh, offer a much more gradual upgrade path to important uh, third-party extensions like NumPy and PyTorch and TensorFlow and Panda. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm not thrilled about the idea of of Python 4 and nobody in the core dev team really is. So probably there never will be a 4.0 and we'll just keep numbering uh, until 3.33 at least. Yeah, and that makes totally sense to me. Um, okay, so uh, I know that we are about at time, so I would love to conclude this uh, wonderful conversation actually with a, with a question that is a little bit different uh, that is about your hobbies like uh, beside the python do you have any other hobbies that you know uh, people can can know a little bit more uh the human interest question yeah well it's sort of i i like reading uh i mean i'm a very boring person uh, i like my family uh when our son was born 19 years ago, uh, I posted a birth announcement on the Python mailing list. I wouldn't do that anymore. Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're more private now. Uh, I do like reading science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I like watching shows in that area, especially uh, with our teenager who is now 19 and wants to be a <laughs> okay I can I can admit that uh, Orlane wants to be a bass player in a metal band so that's that's like the career choice that is sort of most different from uh, what his parents <laughs> are doing <laughs> which is very typical and I, I fully support him in that uh, but more about myself uh, 
Uh, I like to hike. I like to uh, go on bike rides. Nothing very strenuous. I have a friend who occasionally uh, rides his bike across the United States. I could never do a oh. thing like that. That's that's like that's impressive. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I go for a two hour bike ride and uh, my spirits have been lifted and uh, then I lift my bike onto the the bike rack on the back of the car and we drive home. That's that's how I like to do it. That that sounds very very yeah. nice, especially you know with the with the good weather that you have in California. Oh yeah, that, <laughs> I, we, we love it here. <laughs> we're, we're we're really very happy. Perfect. So unfortunately, we are at time. And uh, I personally really, really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot uh, more about you know, Python and yourself. So uh, thank you so much again for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank and you. You've, you've, you've been a very good interviewer. That I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> and also I want to thank you know, uh, the, the rest of the guests. Thank you all for uh, coming. And uh, thank you, Guido. Again, uh, it would be it would be very nice to keep in touch and uh, learn more about your Python projects at uh, Microsoft. Of course. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you again. Bye, everyone. <laughs>